Christ! Where? Where am I? Hey, if this is because I spread misinformation online, I'll admit, I should have spread more. Hello, Trip. It is me, copyright friendly game master horror puppet. Or, <laughs> for short. Oh, hello! Why am I here? I would like to have an enjoyable time by engaging in arbitrary tasks that stimulate the brain, thereby releasing dopamine and giving one a feeling of pleasure. So, a game. No, that's copywritten. This is different. A game isn't copywritten, dude. Yes, it is. I think I would know more about games than you do. I'm a puppet. Anyway, in front of you is a photo. It is of your deepest nightmares, and- Well, actually, it really isn't. You know I play up the whole, Ooh, this dog haunts me shtick for what I assume to be comedy, right? So don't interrupt me. That image is of your deepest nightmares, because it reflects on your own true self. You've been slacking, Mr. Boros. It symbolizes how little you value your life. <laughs> what, because I've not completed an arbitrary video game challenge that I shat out one day? It shows lack of commitment. I mean, I hate commitments in general. I wouldn't really be surprised if I was absent from my own funeral, if I'm being Moving honest. on, Mr. Boros. Call me Trip, please. To your left, you will see a window. Beyond it is your phone. Load it up to Twitter.com. Oh, I know that site. I know. And we have currently loaded up a tweet on your account with a link to some erotic furry artwork. Once this transmission ends, a timer will begin. And you know, I don't think anyone would find it that odd if I put furry porn on my Twitter. They will. No, seriously, I don't think they will. Here, watch this. Headphone. Wait, this wasn't edited into the shot. You actually tweeted that? Well, yeah. It's easier to just do it than having to edit it in. Well, this art is worse. And once the timer hits zero, this finger will be pushed to the screen. And the tweet will be sent off to the world. Okay, but there's a delete button, though. People will have already seen it, Trib. It wouldn't make a difference. Also, how am I supposed to do what you're asking if my hands are tied? They'll be freed at the end of this transmission. But you feel real stupid, don't you? I have a new game to play then. How about I leave your stupid ass to rot in that room? Did you know that starvation is one of the most painful ways to die? How does that sound? Does that sound fun? I thought you said game was copyrighted. <laughs> Damn, dude. <clears throat> Welcome back, Blood Circulation. Well, he did make a good point. Alright, fine. But first... Sponsorship. Conan Exiles has introduced the Age of Sorcery. This new update allows you to become a master of the corrupting forces of magic. And hey, what's the price you pay? Oh, nothing much, just your literal life force and stamina. Sorcerers are able to summon demonic and undead followers, vanish from sight, and conjure darkness or even storms. There's also been a rebalance to attributes and perks, including a unique perk for the most dedicated sorcerers. And that's not all. Building has received an overhaul. With a new UI and and improved controls, along with a creative mode, allowing players to build whatever they want without worrying about material costs. And finally, ages make their debut, each having their own theme, free updates, and battle passes, offering evenly placed content drops and an easy way for players to support the game to receive exclusive themed cosmetics. So if you're interested in tackling the dark arts, you can click the link in the description and start playing today. And hey, thanks to Conan Exiles for sponsoring the video. It is here! 
It is finally here. My neuro take, but we're at last at the finish line. And much like last time, I'm not gonna have much of an intro here because if you're here, you likely already know the gist. But on the off chance that the algorithm brought you here or something, check out part one because this finale is already going to be long enough as it is. So let's just get right to it, shall we? We last left off on Pluto, finishing up a boss that I would have been perfectly fine substituting in favor of eating a bowl of toenails and getting my first of what would be many non-stug kills, spoiler alert. But with Ambi down, I then tackled the rest of Pluto's nodes and set my eyes on the final two junctions, the Ares Junction and the Sedna Junction. I decided to tackle Ares first as its requirements weren't as problematic to deal with. And some relics and a defense node later, I go in. Inside, I'm met with the Mesa and we kinda just politely exchange bullets until one of us falls over. After realizing that she has a redeemer on her, I use it to charge my iron skin and then tank through the rest of the fight. And after blowing our space load, Ares is now unlocked to us. And Ares is where we are introduced to the Hive mission type. And it was on this day that I was forced to learn things I shouldn't have had to. For instance, did you know that these things heal the full if you don't damage it for five seconds? Because I didn't. See, usually, on my main account, I look at these things and they pop, and then I move on. Ho ho ho, but here, behold my damage. Cool, right? Yeah, I was doing so little that this was the first instance I actually started to run out of ammo, even with ammo mutation. So it's a good thing that I had the foresight to make ammo pads. And to make matters worse, by the last hive, Eximus units would start spawning. And if they were something like an Arctic Eximus or Life Leech Eximus, it made hive popping next to impossible. And killing them wasn't an option, as it would eat into my already precious ammo economy. So, what I did instead was restart the entire mission until I got an Eximus that I could somewhat ignore, uh, for the most part. A and I'm kind of skimming over this hellscape, not because it wasn't that bad, but because we just have a lot to cover in this finale video. If I had the time, I would continue to maul over how frustrating this was and how many attempts it took, but we must move on. After that, I made the discovery that at some point, my rhino's fat ass somehow got a kill. And if I had to guess, it was probably because of his passive. But we've already fucked the run, so it be what it be, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I decided to take a quick break to do the next mastery rank test. Why? Because, if you'll recall, we need to be MR5 to take on Vehek. Uh, but for some reason, I don't have the footage of me doing the test. I'm not sure why, but trust me, you really aren't missing much. But I know that you're oh so curious what it was like. So you know what? I'll just do it again. Here you go. Riveting, right? With that done, I then took a quick detour to start the Jordas Precept quest. And uh, I later learned that doing this quest was a massive waste of time as Jordis Golem does not count as a chart node. I won't say that I was molding because I'm too busy molding to say so. Anyway, I didn't actually do the quest in its entirety quite yet since the fight with Jordis is literally impossible to do on my own due to run stipulations. And I also needed to make Feraliac pods, so I put the quest on the back burner for the time being. After that, I cleared the rest of Ares, then set my eyes on the final junction, Sedna's. Its requirements include crafting an MR5 weapon killing some sentience, and defeating Vehek. Oh goody. And since I was in the mood for some overgrown chicken nuggies, I decided to go after the really loud bird man first. Vehek was actually a boss I was pretty worried about, because the Stug's projectiles seemed to hold a meeting every week to decide whether or not they should damage a specific entity. So it honestly felt like there was a pretty high chance that I simply wouldn't be able to hurt him at all during his first phase. Not to mention how the fucker radically floats around. But luckily, for once, my fears were ill-found. Not only did did he take damage just fine, he actually took way more than I was expecting. And once phase one was out of the way, phase two was an absolute joke. With my nuggies acquired, I booked it back to the ship. At this point, I, for some reason, decided to once again take a detour and go do the patient zero quest instead of finishing up the junction requirements. I can't remember why, but whatever. Oh, and by the way, this quest line involving moldy salad is also unnecessary 
necessary. So this too was also a complete waste of time, much like Jordis. Except this waste of time felt like I spent two hours sounding myself. Mainly because I had to do more Hive missions, but also because Mutilus Alad V is basically impossible solo. His shields are simply too strong for me to damage to get through, and to make matters worse, he has constant invulnerability phases. Meaning, unless I can both chew through his shields and take a bit of life as well, the fight was basically impossible on my own. So, with that said, you may now notice that I'm not solo for this fight, but I'm still fighting him on my own. Why is that? Because after countless trial and error, I figured that my best compromise was this. I would bring a shield disruption, and I would also have someone else join me in the mission, also equipped with a shield disruption. This would weaken his shields enough for me to get damage in with my stun. But also, having another person in the mission allows Salad to throw out his mind control collar. See, whenever it's attached to a player, Salad cannot go invulnerable, so this added another period in which I could do damage. Of course, it still wasn't a walk in the park, mainly because Salad seemed to exclusively target me with the collar, likely because he saw me as a Discord kitten. Oh yeah, and the fact that having another player in the mission makes mobs more difficult to kill in general. And the fact that fucking Eczemai kept spawning, and god forbid one of the Eczemai spawning as a health leech, because those guys can actually heal Salad. Still, this was my plan, and there were a few failed attempts, one of which, fun fact, resulted in my mind-controlled rhino stabbing Sab with my broken war and killing him. And yes, this did count as a kill on my profile, so I can now chalk up a literal player murder on my list of fuck-ups. But eventually, we got a hang of the fights, and Slowly, I was able to chip through Salad's health. And soon enough, he popped. And I would once again like to remind you that all of this was a complete waste of time that could have been avoided if I simply checked a few web zones. With that over with, it was time to also deal with Jordas. Now, this is where I do a bit of what we call in the business an Omega fuck, but we'll get into that in just a bit. So unfortunately, Jordas Golem is also an impossible boss fight as it forces you into Arcwing. And like we discovered in a previous part, there's no way to kill things in Arcwing without them counting as non-stug kills, so I once again brought in some help. But I did kill the Juggernaut Behemoth on my own, who wasn't terribly difficult outside of being a bullet sponge. With him killed, we get sucked out into space and engage with Jordis, who for some reason got glitched into the geometry and was unable to move. Also, I for some reason don't have footage of Jordis actually dying, but to be honest, you didn't miss much of a fight anyways. I mean, it was just Sab shooting a stationary target while I sat on the sidelines playing cheerleader. So, yeah. But here is where that Omega fuck that I brought up a moment ago uh, comes in. See, the Jordis quest requires you to go through a tedious process of crafting Fairlyak pods and testing them in various missions before being able to go to the node. So I figured, hey, what if I just have someone pull me into the node? Maybe then I can skip the entire process. And it seemed like it worked. The footage you just saw and are watching are from this attempt where I got taxied in, and the node worked just fine. However, when we extracted, I couldn't help but notice that the node had not counted as completed. In other words, I had to deal with the Fairly Act pod crafting, whether I liked it or not. Or, or, and hear me out on this, I actually didn't have to, because yet for another reminder, this node was not required! So, once again, to just stress this point, this was a giant waste of time because I refused to read. But, you, you, whatever. So, with that obstacle being a thing that I thought I had to deal with, I decided to do something else for the time being. So, back I went to clear those last junction requirements. I crafted an MR5 weapon to settle one, and then went off to Lua to kill some sentience to finish another. And with that, we can now tackle the last junction of the run. And the babysitter for this final fight was Saren. And, uh, if you were expecting a climatic final fight, unfortunately, I must burst your bubble because she kinda bit the curb. Like, badly. Like, uh, wow, get absolutely obliterated. And with one final laser beam, all junctions have been complete. So now, we had yet another planet to run through. And Sedna also has a new node type, specifically arenas. Arenas are necessary to do in order to gain access to this planet's boss, Kayla. And my god, are arena enemies tanky as balls! Now, to be fair, the first two nodes of it weren't too bad, but the max difficulty arena 
was absurd. I could barely do damage to anything. And even though there's infinitely respawning ammo and energy, they all had extremely strong shields. So even with technically infinite resources, it still felt impossible to crack them. So... It was time for some trial and error. And after messing around a bit, I came to the conclusion that the easiest to kill or an enemy is Executioner Zura, the one that could summon cats. Out of every other enemy, she went down the quickest and seemed to have the weakest shields. But whenever you spawn into an arena, the enemies you fight are chosen at random. So to circumvent this, I would load into an arena, check the scoreboard to see if she was present, and if not, I would kill the game process. And I just kind of kept doing this until she showed up. Once she did appear, I spent about 52 hours killing her to grind out the 25 kills necessary to complete the arena. And with my newly acquired judgment points, we can now take on Kayla. And uh, I was worried about this. Now, you might be thinking it was because of Kayla, right? Well, yeah, I was absolutely pissing myself in fear, but more importantly, these fucking things. Like I've said before, the Stug kind of just arbitrarily decides whether its projectiles should affect something or not. And in order to even get into the fight, you have to shoot this switch. And wouldn't you know it, the Stug doesn't press the switch. But luckily, the game isn't so spaghetti-coded that the buttons count as enemies or anything, so I was able to just swap to a Breton and activate them that way. As for Kayla herself, she was a bit difficult, but not nearly as bad as I was expecting. Honestly, the biggest struggle was in regards to ammo. She, like many enemies lately, has a shield. But not just that, she moves a lot, resulting in a ton of wasted shots, and her jumping all over the place allows her to recoup some of her shields. She also took pitiful damage from my stug, though that could have been just because I had magnetic equipped to deal with her shields. Which, fun fact, didn't seem to work anyway, as she's immune to procs whenever her shields are up. What a joy. Anyway, unfortunately, my recording problems once again reared their ugly heads because I apparently don't have footage of her death either, which is really fucking annoying. But just take my word on this, she wasn't nearly as bad as Salad, just a bit tedious. And if that seems like a cop-out, don't worry, there is a much worse boss that I actually do have full footage of to make up for it. Regardless, it was then time for big story progression. In particular, it was War Within Time. Sensing a disturbance in the non-copyright infringing force, Lobus sends us back to the reservoir to do some maintenance and address the issue. But instead of a space squirrel chewing on some space wires, we instead find our favorite sentient space table. And Legasp, he's aligned with the queens. After after showing me his $35 sword he purchased off of ebay.com, I promptly showed him what I thought of it. After that, he gets upset and flees. After capturing his spectre for info on his whereabouts, I extract and we continue on. Once another spectre has been captured, we're given the coordinates. And so off we go to do a stupid little dance around a ship for 12 hours. After avoiding the lasers, doing some miscellaneous stuff, and then having to kill everyone because the Lotus fucking hates me, it was then time to leave. Except it wasn't. Instead, we head off into the Kuva Fortress to confront Teshin and the Queens. And soon enough, we locate them and their god-awful room aesthetic like, holy shit. Meeting Teshin again, the Queens make their appearance, and it seems that they want our body. To which I reply, look at this face, and then consider how low their standards are. Then our operator delivers a top-notch line delivery. Enough! Exquisite. Anyway, Teshin throws a frisbee at my head, the old hag beams cringe directly into my brain, and we white out. Regaining consciousness back in the ship, it seems we've lost our eldritch space powers, and in retaliation, Ortis fucking evicts us from our own ship. You know, I occasionally get some shit from people for not liking Ortis, but you'll have to excuse me for not liking someone that ejects me into a fucking Skyrim snow mountain! And yeah, I know this isn't real, this is all happening in the operator's head, but then what does that say about the operator's opinion to Ortis, hmm? After wandering around for a bit, and coming across the corpse of what I can only assume to be me, Teshin shows back up. We tried to deliver a clothesline, get immediately shut down, and continue on our way. We try to activate an orb, but do a little clumsy whoopsie and plummet off the side of a cliff. 
upon waking up with one additional bone in our body, it was time to face the Golden Maw, in which I immediately fuck up and get eaten. But afterwards, I remember how to play this game that I've been playing for the past nine years, and we blaze through the rest of the trials. And before long, we unlock Void Sling, Void Mode, and Transference. And after accidentally throwing myself off a cliff, becoming a point of light, and then falling off a cliff again, we walk through some more lore exposition, before we decide to destroy a mirror, and are kicked back to the scene of the Queen and her stupid drill thing. We disrupt the link, and our frame falls into the drink. Following that, we get kicked back to our orbiter in present time. And after terrifying the shit out of Ordas by showing him what an abomination we've become, he points out how the Queen's base has moved, and that with the transference system fried, it's impossible to find it again. In response, we show Ordas the definition of Deus Ex Machina. And after teleporting back into our frame, we then have this exchange with Teshin. Why did you come back? I came back for you. Game! Then it was time for some combat, and unfortunately, it was against some Kuva Guardians. And for some reason, I'm lacking my Stug. So that's fan-fucking-tastic, and I'm sure you know what this means. It's time for some more footwork. After using Void Sling to remove their invincibility, it was just a matter of bullet jumping a few times on each Guardian's face, and then destroying the braids that surround the Queens. Oh, and a uh, uh, fun fact, by the way, I forgot you needed to use Void Damage to destroy these braids? The game doesn't really tell you that, so I may have spent six minutes fumbling around wondering why my feet weren't damaging these damn braids. So that was fun. So then we repeat the cycle of foot rubbing guardians and blasting some braids, until eventually we have to deal with Teshin. Once again, due to lacking a stug, it was all down to my feet to do the work. But oddly, for reasons I can only fathom, Teshin is immune to both bullet jumps and dive kicks. Like completely, I wasn't seeing any damage numbers or any health loss. So with no other option available to me, I had to use the sword. But luckily, since you don't kill Teshin, this doesn't leave a mark on our record. Anyway, Teshin's brain then seems to bug out, and he stops fighting entirely, allowing me to just kinda whack him with my stick over and over until he eventually falls. At which point, the queen becomes vulnerable. Teshin explains that she only holds dominion over him thanks to her staff. So, uh, naturally, yoink! And with the staff in our possession, we now command Tablehead. And not wanting to sully my hands with a non-stug kill, we order him to send the queen to the great retirement home in the sky. After a reunion atop a familiar mountain, we're told to do something with a substance that is notorious for its power in corrupting essence. So, of course, we drink that shit, and with that, the war within is complete. Following that, we get a message, with the personal quarter segment blueprint attached. And this is important, as we needed to access the last part of the star chart. So, after getting some argon for it, I set it up for construction, and then turned my attention to a new goal. With the war within finished, we now had access to the Kuva Fortress. So, to burn some time, I tackled that. And other than a particularly annoying disruption node, because... It's fucking disruption. Everything went pretty smoothly. I then went back to Jordas Golem. Uh, you know, the fight that I didn't have to do because I'm an idiot, uh, a buffoon, an utter moron, thinking that he is in fact a more off. But regardless, this time I had done the whole shebang with testing the pods and whatnot, so we fought the Golem again. And by we, I mean Sab. I kind of just ran into it over and over like a moth stuck in a fluorescent lamp. Oh, and by the way, Jordan's Golem got perma-glitched in the geometry not in just the last fight, but this one too. So it was, once again, less of a battle, and more of just me, again, in my cheerleader outfit, watching my manslave hold Mouse 1 on a stationary, defenseless weak point. With that absolute waste of time and resources out of the way, I then handled a few miscellaneous nodes, and immediately threw myself into something that didn't in involved me flushing precious hours of my life down the drain. It was time for Chains of Harrow. Now, funnily enough, had I not procrastinated on this whole challenge for as long as I did, we would have been done after I cleared the Kuva Fortress in the Deimos quest, because there'd just not be any more nodes. So Chains of Harrow, The Sacrifice, Chimera, New War? Yeah, all that would have been unnecessary. But ever since Angles of the Zeremon added well, the Zeremon, that area now counts towards completion. So while I could have technically ended it here, I figured I'd punish myself for being a lazy dickhead and deal with the Zeremon too. And so, on to Chains of Hero we go. After intercepting a spooky message and learning that DE discovered directional audio panning, 
I can do that too, you're not special. We're sent off to investigate the signal. And after arriving in Great Value Dead Space, Palindrome contacts us requesting assistance. And after a quick shootout defending her from her legion of simps, thus becoming the Omega Simp, we extract and are informed that she serves as a speaker to someone named Rel. But because she's missing a special knickknack, she is unable to communicate with him. So can you guess which space Amazon delivery boy gets tasked with solving this problem? If you guessed me, I offer you an applause. One clap for each brain cell you use to come to that conclusion. As we go to find the package, we're informed that Rel is in fact a child, one who was also aboard the Xeramin at the time of its disaster. And yet, he isn't a Tenno. Apparently, he was cast out for being, quote, different. So it's good to know that even when floating through empty space on a quickly deteriorating ship with zero communication to outside systems, thousands of light years away from home, with their parents having gone insane and murderous from Eldritch space energy delusions, children will still find ways to be pricks to each other. A bit later, I spot something of Interest. Paladino mentions how this something is special to Rel, how his mother gave it to him, how it helps with his sensitivity to stimulus and lets him focus. It would be a right shame if he lost it to some green and yellow colored twat. Stealing is morally correct. Rel, showing his displeasure towards my thieving antics, attacks me with spooky shadows, and so I flee like a coward. Following extraction, we attempt to communicate once more, and after a quick memory lore dump, Lotus brings up some bullshit that I don't quite understand other than it involves involves literal ghost busting. And it was also at this point in writing this script that I realized if I kept going over every single step of a quest in regards to its lore, I would be here until Soul Frame's release. So blah 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 man in the wall, blah blah more ghost busting, blah blah. Hey look, we're at the end. And now, it's time for a fun story. See, this ending to this quest was a roadblock that I was worried about ever since I started this challenge 17 years ago. This final bit forces you into operator mode and requires you to kill some spooky shadow specters, and there's no way to recall your frame either. And trust me, I tried just about everything. And because of this, this last bit essentially forces you to get kills without any access to your stug or any way to kill them without adding to your kill count. But at the time, I found an extremely useful glitch. By quickly going in and back out of operator mode at the sliding floor door, the game would let me progress into the fight with my frame. And I even have an image of me in my frame in the boss arena about a year ago when I was experimenting for this run. But unfortunately, this this is where things take a bit of a classic DE turn. See, this glitch required the ability to transfer from operator to frame at a fast pace. And some of you may be aware that this is no longer possible in the current version of the game. Or at the very least, it still isn't when I was recording all of this. And uh... Here's where things get funny. Because believe it or not, the reason you can't quickly transfer in and out anymore isn't because DE patched it, it's because of a glitch, according to DE anyway. That's right, this weird delay slash cooldown on transference, it's a bug. So, you know, just to quickly spell it out, DE introduced a bug that fixed my bug that I was going to use to get through this part of the quest. I couldn't make this shit up if I tried. And sadly, even though I spent hours trying to find another method, I simply wasn't able to find anything. And I'm sure there is some method, but I'm not joking when I said I tried everything I could think of. I tried killing myself with fall damage before entering the room, but since DE added shields to operators, that was now impossible. I tried getting Rel himself to shoot the shadows with his projectiles, but that didn't work either. I tried luring them off of ledges, but they would just respawn up top. I tried summoning specters, but their kills counted as mine. I tried pulling another player in, but the quest is solo only. And I tried going back into my frame the moment that I crossed the trigger for the floor to open, but it just was not working. So I'm sure you get the point now, I tried every single idea that I could conjure up. So this is sadly the first instance where we are required to get non-stug kills. At least until someone finds another method that D doesn't accidentally fix with a fucking bug! Defeated. I hand blast the shadow people, Rel takes a nappy, and Chains of Hero is complete. Requiring 25 unavoidable kills. So, we're at the final stretch now, and it's mostly down to quests. So I'm going to be a bit speedier in my coverage of this nigh unending hell. With our previously crafted personal quarters, we're able to start Apostasy Prologue, becoming an orphan for the uh, third time? Fourth? 
I've lost count. And so it was time for our next quest requirement, the sacrifice. After furry man go a woo, we do some evidence tracking. And even though I've done the sacrifice at least four times for various reasons, I still take a solid seven minutes trying to find the last piece. Following that, we head to Lua, where I slam my head into a cipher until the game gives me the answer out of pity and locate Ballas' diaries. Once we get back to the ship, we're able to craft Moon Dad. After showing him our NFTs, he expresses his disappointment. And just before he commits filicide for the second time, we remind him of the first time, thus beginning one of the most fucked up segments in all of gaming. After that, we regain consciousness back at the ship and are informed that Umbra has fled to Ceres, which is impressive given that there's no possible way for him to have done that without throwing himself out the airlock. Props. So off we go to find him again. Once we do, we stun him and then regain our front row seats to this shit again. After absolutely destroying Ball Ass and Comey and presumably blowing a raspberry at him, we're kicked out again and have to go on the hunt once more. After finding him again and giving him a quick concussion, we're back in the mine prison. I suck balls at some Comey, get kicked out, and the cycle repeats, I'm sure you get it by now. So let's skip ahead, shall we? Eventually, we're able to make his horrible memory even worse by implanting ourselves into it. Hey look, it's that filicide thing again. But after some words of encouragement, we become one, both feeling emptiness for two vastly different reasons. He, having been forced to relive one of the worst experiences possible for the rest of time, and me, having been forced to play a video game. <laughs> so hey, are you ready for some more hot garbage? Because it's time for this segment. In this bit, you play as Umbra, with nothing but a sword, against sentience that I am forced to kill. I don't have my stug, and the sentients are known for their ability to adapt to damage, which my feet already do very little of. And to make matters more complicated, anytime I need to go into operator, say to avoid dash in order to strip sentient resistances, Umbra controls on his own and threatens to get kills that, yes, are marked on my profile. So my plan was this. Focus one sentient at a time, show them the footwork, and when their adaptive armor came up, I would run a good distance away, put Umbra behind a wall, and then strip the sentient's armor. As long as I left Umbra far enough, I'd be able to get this done before he killed anything. And you know what? The strat worked better than I expected. It only took about four minutes to kill all the sentients. Sure, the average player gets this done in four seconds, but let me have this. With Umbra acquired, it was time to find Ballman. Hey look, the Ballman located. And this time, I was properly armed. After dealing with some sentients, we show Ball ass where his kidneys are and deliver yet another fantastic line. Squirm. Like the maggot you are. <laughs> Incredible. Anywho, mom shows up again, reminds us that we're adopted, leaves for the fifth time, and the sacrifice is done. After that, we have Prelude to War, which is split into three sections, but I'm not really gonna cover it very much since there really isn't much gameplay here. Like, 80% of it is cutscenes. But hey, here's a quick rundown. Ballas creates and gives us something that will totally become important later on. There's a flashback to the old war, a scene that probably won't become oddly familiar later, a rousing game of spot the protagonist, and mom getting yoted into a wall. So let's move on. And finally, we can start the new war. Except we can't, because I still need a fucking railjack and a necromech. Oh god damn it. And after seeing all the bullshit that I would have to jump through in order to get these two things, I'm pretty damn happy that I got rid of the no buying platinum rule because you can bet your shit I was going to use the ultimate tool to bypass all this nonsense my credit card. See, you can actually just buy a fully built railjack and necromech in a bundle. And by god. If that meant I didn't have to waste any more time on pointless side quests, I was down for it. Except I couldn't have it entirely my way, because we needed to complete Heart of Deimos before I could even buy the pack. So begrudgingly, I accepted this deal, and it was time for Deimos. After landing on the second worst planet in the solar system, we meet the Entrotis, a classic analog to the average Canadian family. And TLDR, their planet is having a literal heart attack, so we're sent to fix it. But not before we're sent to do a bunch of side objectives, like watching a noodle pop another noodle and fishing. Yeah, let's, let's just skip to the heart, shall we? So here is where things get fucky. See, you're forced into a necromech here. You cannot get out and are told to kill a shit ton of infested. 
And unlike bullet jumping with frames, mobility damage in a mech does count towards your kill profile. I wandered around a bit to see if I could lead them anywhere to possibly game in themselves, but I didn't have any luck with that either. So at this point, I was omega pissed and also out of options. And thus, this segment led to our next group of required non-stug kills, unfortunately. So I did that, and then performed some delicate heart surgery. By which I mean, I wiggled a fire extinguisher over all of its sore spots until it felt better. Enter a grandma piloting a mech and landing it in the worst way possible. Time for another fight. And yet again, this is another required kill, unfortunately. If I couldn't handle a few infested, it probably wouldn't surprise you that I also had to shoot this thing down the old fashioned way either. After exploding it, I explode, leave, and chalk up another 45 kills required on the board. But on the plus side, we've now completed Deimos, meaning it was new war time. And just to remind you, I'm going to be speeding through this and mainly just talking about the gameplay. Seriously, look in my script scroll bar, please dear god have mercy! <laughs> so I buy the pack from before, and off we go. In regards to the bits where you play as different characters, I'm not sure if their kills are added to your profile or not, since, fun fact, you can't check your stats when playing as Call, Visa, or Teshin, but I did try my best to minimize what needed to be killed anyways. For Call, I was able to run past quite a lot of things, up until the objective to get to the miners camp. For some reason, the objective objective marker wasn't updating to the actual camp and just leading me to a dead end. It wasn't until I killed something that this actually let me go in the right direction. I think it could have been possible to avoid this had I known where to go without relying on the marker, but I'll never know. Anywho, we get a bomb, get threatened by a chopstick, are forced to kill it with a shoot gun, this doesn't count chat, and are made to kill some sentience as part of the quest. But with that done, we jump over to Vico, and for some reason, Sai is telling me about the Omni tool for use on the Railjack. So anyway, much like Call, I just tried running past whatever I could here. And lucky for me, a lot of Vito's segment is just puzzles. So for a good chunk of the quest, I could just ignore the angry robots. Except that one. So I shot the jackal down like normal, and oh god fucking damn it, Railjack. Right. And the objective actually wants us to use it. Oh no, sure, that's fine. So I handle that, and then just ignore this swarm of angry bees as I approach the Murex. And... Teshin time. And unlike the other two, Teshin can actually do jump kicks. So for the parts I needed to kill shit, I had the perfect tool to do so. Hell, I was even able to kick some balls to death. Though there were some exceptions. Mainly these mantis shrimp looking motherfuckers. So for them, it was sword time. And hell, even if I could hurt them with my feet, I can't exactly avoid the finisher, so uh, whatever. Next up was a bunch of cutscenes, including, hey look, who could have guessed? And were kicked into the drifter. And lucky me, they can also jump kick. Plus, a lot of this early section is just stealthing around anyway, so bonus. Though, I did have to feet rub some sentience, and this time, I didn't have a way to strip their adaptations. So, you can imagine how fun this was. The answer being, I wish I had brought some rope. After a snaking the skate lady, <laughs> what? It was time for some more cool stealth segments. And other than having a seizure at one point and dying, not much to say here. Also, you can't really kill anything here anyways, so... I get to the outpost, dropkick some more VR chat players, become a VR chat player, do some more sneaking, and leave. Then comes... the Archons. Oh goody. We'll get to those in a moment. But before that, Hunhao seemed set on teaching me how to use this funky new bow. I, however, had to decline after learning that it didn't even have power 5 on it. Luckily, even though I had to kill some sentience here, there's no game check to see if I did it with the bow. So after about 10 minutes of drop kicks, we could move on. At which point, he had a new test for me. After training against some mobile targets that could shoot back at me, he decided we need to step it up a notch by training against some balloons. Though this was a bit trickier, because these guys do count as enemies. So unlike Kayla's spinning discs, I cannot shoot them. And if I just tried to ignore them and ride the elevator up, they would kill me far before I got to the top. And since our drifter isn't as mobile as our mecha meat suits, jumping up after them to give them a 
good drop kick wasn't an option either. And waiting for them to get in range for a kick would just result in them exploding on my balls. So, the hard way then. After a bit of trial and error, I started to rely on three things. One, the balloons don't respawn once detonated unless you die. Two, there were parts of the map I could jump onto to avoid their explosions. And three, I had a reusable heal that could let me tank through some of them. Combine all this together, and we have the world's most complicated elevator ride, involving me constantly jumping off the platform and stabbing myself in the thigh with heal juice over and over. And this took a while. Mainly because if you're not on the platform as it's getting exploded, you have to wait for it to slowly descend all the way back down to the bottom before you can activate it again. I had to do this for every single balloon. In total, riding these elevators took about 10 minutes, but we get there eventually. And after re-experiencing a lovely childhood school memory in which nothing bad happened, it was Archon time and so, okay, okay, look, I, I have to complain with you, chat. <laughs> See, I, I, I still didn't have access to my Stug and while you can actually hurt and kill the sentient with defeat strategy, I, I didn't. And it wasn't because it was impossible per se, I I was just a weakling. It's not just because they have a metric fuck ton of health, I mean look at this. No, 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 no. The main issue is, if you die, you start over from the beginning. As in, the boss starts with 100% HP again. And remember, I don't have my frame. Dying here is a legitimate threat. You do get one free revive courtesy of the stalker, but go down again and the boss is healed to full. See, if this was just a battle of attrition and fuck-ups had no consequence, I would have sat my ass down and just done it. But the problem is her ability to full heal if I go down twice. And at this point in the run, I was already in my breaking point to begin with after months and months of gameplay. If this was earlier in the run, I probably would have taken down at least one of the Archons this way thanks to having a full tank of motivation. But, and yes, to remind you, you have to do this twice! Remember, there are two of these Drifter vs. Archon fights. But yeah, I, I threw in the towel chat, I I'm sorry. <laughs> Though that's not to say that it's impossible. Hell, this bit of damage here only took about 10 minutes of drop kicking. And that's unoptimized, so it's absolutely doable. I would guess between an hour and a half to two hours. Hell, if you wanted to be extra safe, you could probably just throw a smoke bomb at her, kick her a few times in it, retreat, wait for the smoke bomb's cooldown, and then repeat the process. That strat is mostly risk-free, though it would likely draw the fight out by at least another hour. In fact, you know what? To the first person who can send me an unedited full video of them killing just one of the Archons this way, I will give you a hundred dollars in whatever prepaid card of your choosing. This isn't a joke, if you do it, check out the Google form in the description. Has to be a YouTube link, it can't be edited, and no focus abilities are allowed. You need a completely base drifter like me. I'll update the video description later to let others know that the prize has already been claimed. Why am I doing this? Because if I'm too beaten down to prove that something is doable, I can at least pay someone to prove it for me. But even though I did eventually give up and just shot her to death, the actual killing blow is done by the stalker, so... And for all other Archons, you're forced to put them into a bear hug and rip the crystal out by hand for the killing blow as well. So there's that, I suppose. Anyway, moving on, here's a Space Mom jump scare. Then it was time for Archon number two. I picked Boreal rather than Amar by using a complex algorithm system, a coin flip from Google.com. And uh, Boreal would have probably been even worse than Naira had I not given up just because of the constant AoEs. And if I somehow stuck through and successfully footworked Naira to death, I probably would have broken down here. I hate birds. Eventually, he goes down, I steal his candy, Mom tries to make me return it, but I say no, and she starts chasing me around with a belt. A short time later, I'm rewarded a minor blast of dopamine, get command grabbed by Janemba, become a child, watch Mom leave for the seventh time, and wind up on everyone's favorite haunted spaceship. We get some more lore, and are given a choice between the Drifter and the Operator for the last fight. I decided to pick Drifter, since I knew that he had a drop kick, and I wasn't too sure if the Operator had access to one or not. Oh, 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 oh no. 
That's not right. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite sure what happened here, but essentially the game told me to go fuck myself and decided that I was going to be Drifterator. Sure, whatever. And with my frame reacquired, we were back in this shit. Dropping down to Earth, I decided to see if the game fixed its shit. Oh, for fuck's sakes. Looks like I'm Operator. Sure, that's fine. After breaking Kanzu's neck and being forced back into VR chat, we board a balloon, climb a haunted tower, and get launched into a Murex. I get reacquainted with my weapon of choice by mowing down some chopsticks before Mom forces me to laser beam some sentience because, <laughs> get it? It's a hidden tutorial teaching you how to handle the ballast fight. Isn't it intuitive? Behold, one of the intricate pillars of game design. So this has kind of fucked me. You can't move, recall to your frame, or even die here. I tried hitting escape as well, but you're well and truly stuck here until you play along. So, all right, fine. And technically I'm not even the one killing it, it's mom. At least that's what I tell myself to make me feel better. After a short Budokai beam struggle, I'm forced into railjack combat again. At which point I start wondering if there's anywhere I could buy a stockpile of apple seeds from. Oh, for no particular reason, don't worry about it. We fly into the sun, board mom's mom, and transition into Necromech. And luckily, this isn't like Deimos. I don't have to do shit here, since Era can kill his own kind for me, turning this segment into a walk and wait simulator, which is perfectly fine by me. And it's hard to tell here, but the game had a seizure again and couldn't decide if I was the operator or the drifter. So it gave me the drifter's voice and skeleton on my child's mesh. Check out my neck, dude. But I'm fine after the cutscene. Time for Amar. But with my Stug, he didn't stand a chance. I mean, just look at my damage. Though I do eventually run out of ammo, so I had to resort to the good old ground-based footsies that Warframe is known for to get through the last stretch. And lucky for me, Amar kind and just stood there and took it. Not sure if it was because of all the ice procs or whatever, but uh, sure. Boss time. And the game decided that I was going to be Drifter this time around. Oh, wait, no, oh, that was only the cutscene. What the fuck is happening? Anyways, you know how this fight goes. Reflect some beams, destroy some mirrors, fight some minions, repeat for phase one. And for reasons I can't remember, I didn't use my stuck on these guys. Don't know if I was still out of ammo or just not allowed to use it, but bullet jumping once again comes in clutch. And after enduring both arthritis and Ballas's god tier level of gaslighting, we get to phase two. And not much is different here. Still redirecting lasers, only this time it's from the world's worst smurf. But after that, the fight is basically over. Now you just have to wait for him to monologue. Eventually, I tire of it and decide to show him a cool avatar world that I found. And, oh, oh my god, the video keeps getting longer. Okay, ball man dies, mom back, a wall shows up, we're done, moving on! After that, I did some node cleanup, going after and finishing up any stragglers that I may have missed. And then, at one point, I picked my head into the node containing the worst boss of the run, Zeloid Prelate. So here's the problem. Zeloid is largely a pseudo DPS check. In order to damage him past phase one, you need to kill a certain mob and make them drop a lantern. Then you bring that lantern over to Zeloid and whilst he's in range of its AOE, he's vulnerable to damage. But over time, the area of the effect shrinks and eventually collapses altogether. The only way to sustain it is by killing enemies. Can you see the problem here? You need enough deeps to spread between both Zeloid and the enemies to keep the lantern alive. But that's just one of his checks. Indeed, he has another that he can do like four times. At certain thresholds, Zeloid creates beams of light to nearby enemies. If you don't kill them, he heals off of them. And Zeloid has a lot of health. If you do not have the deeps to kill him, you're SOL. And to make matters worse, when you attempt to get close to damage him whilst you have a lantern, he will constantly jump around, wasting what precious time you have to deal them deeps. Now, the reason I say that he's a pseudo DPS check and not a real one is because it's not the end of the world if you let him heal or break a lantern. Because with enough time, you can slowly chip through it. And that's basically what what I had to do. Because unlike with the Archons, there's no consequence for dying unless you eat up all four of your revives. However, there is a giant hurdle that made me put this fight off for right now. Ammo. This fight drained the 
fuck out of my ammo pads. To the point where, taking into account the number of pads I used in my first attempt, I only really had two or three tries left before I was just completely out of them. So I noped the fuck out of there, and instead went after Rope Below List. Rope is significantly easier, and yet, unlike Zeloid, he is also impossible on my own. How so? Because you can only kill Rope by blasting him with a terminal laser at the end of the fight, which adds a kill to your profile. If you refuse to blast him, he will never go down. So I brought my manslave back in again to do nothing except press a button whilst I handled the fight on my own. By the by, this dick lick thought it would be funny to bring a fucking speed nova, which increased the damage output of all these damn minions, who, need I remind you, already had boosted health due to it being a multiplayer session, so this fight was actually harder than it needed to be. Anywho, Rope's fight is part gimmick and part can you aim properly, because if not, Lamau. Running him into the giant moth lights was simple enough. But after that, you gotta damage these weak points on him whilst he flails around and at the same time avoid dying to the dozens of amalgams that are on the field. Which, just to reiterate, were being made harder by my own button pusher. But besides that, there weren't any major roadblocks for the fight. It was mainly just an aim and ammo check. Though there were some oddities, and he did take all my revives. At one point, Rope just walked off the ledge. At another, he walked off the ledge again, except this time with me in his hand like some fucked up Smash Brothers Kirby side. And then immediately after that, he command grabbed me on my wake up. There was also one scary moment where we missed the button push and he went back up to full health, but with his weak points destroyed, I could just aim in his general direction to get him back down. And once we did that, the funny button was pressed and we could finally leave. Then it was back to Zeloid, though this time with a bit of help. Yeah, after my first attempt, I really didn't see myself being able to kill Zeloid due to how many checks he demands of you, especially with that fucking healing phase he has. With that said though, I was still the only one dealing actual damage, I just had some support with Molecular Prime, speeding up mobs so that I could charge the lanterns more quickly. And even with some assistance, it still took me an hour to get him to one fourth of his HP. Since remember, I was still the only one actually attacking him as I still wanted to do it and I crashed. Yep, my game crashed. An hour of work down the drain. At this point, I started to wonder what bleach would taste like. So, back in we went again, but this time, Zeloid faced the wrath of two stugs. Since, yeah, after that nonsense, I was not in the mood to get him back down to where I had him on my own. Regardless, that's Zeloid in a nutshell. Probably the most difficult boss in the run, besides the Archons, and is absolutely the hardest if we only consider bosses I can actually use my stug on. And hey, we only got one thing left to do, Angles of the Zeremon. But this is going to be a bit different, because to be blunt, this quest was more or less just a tutorial on how to do the mission nodes, so I'm honestly just going to skip the quest itself and do a rundown on the nodes instead. First up, Void Cascade. Of the last three nodes, this one was probably the second hardest. Void Cascade is a weird mix of mobile defense and interception, with a little bit of excavation thrown in. And it's also where we once again must eat shit. See, you don't actually have to kill anything to complete a Void Cascade. So similar to how I handled interception missions, I would just go to a cascade, close it, then run to the next one and close it. And if a Thrax ended up opening a previous one, I would go back and close it again. And this is is enough to get me through this mission type, except in the quest, you are forced to kill a Thrax just to start the bloody mission. And they can only be harmed by void damage, so... That's a bit arse cakes. I suppose if I hated myself, I could have tried to get Zaku and use their one buff to give the Stug Void, but I don't even know if that would work and I couldn't be arse to try. After failing the quest a few times, I do eventually get through it. And then later on, I completed the node itself no problem, mainly because I wasn't forced to commit homicide. Next, we got Void Flood. This node locally was quite a bit easier, since it's mainly comprised of jumping around and grabbing blueberries. 
strawberries. However, both the quest and the regular node this time demand violence of you regardless. Specifically, you have to kill some Thrax again. So after being forced to exterminate them in my quest version of the node, I hopped into a public lobby and let them kill them for me in the actual node itself. But, besides that one hurdle, not a hard mission. And now it's time for our very last node. This is Void Armageddon, and because I can't have anything nice, this one was particularly difficult. So, for our first problem, in the quest we're forced to build a turret to begin the mission. And as far as I know, we cannot dismantle it before the waves start pouring in, and the turret counts towards our kill count. So that's great. But unlike the previous two nodes, there is another issue. My lack of DPS has come back to haunt me. See, waves in Armageddon aren't on timers. Well, I mean, they kind of are, but I, I can't go into specifics. Basically, if you're too slow dealing with one wave, the game will have no qualms spitting out the next one. Meaning, you could still be dealing with one wave and then get another wave at point B, for instance. And while this wasn't a problem in the quest version due to it being finished a bit differently, in the regular node, this made shit way more complicated. So... Uh... On my first attempt, both Exo Dampers fell, granting the enemies two buffs. The first was just electric damage. Not too problematic. But, uh, the second one? Tell me. Uh, or, like, pictures uh, and stuff, but... uh, Look at the upper left buff that they yeah, just I'm, got. I'm watching. I'm, I'm watching pissed. It. Do they all have... Oh my god, they all have overguard. This run is over, dude. <laughs> what the fuck? So then I figured I could just maybe distract them long enough and maybe the game will move on to phase two and let me leave so now witness me a clueless man get reminded in real time why that wouldn't work i don't think i actually have to fucking kill them i think i just have to wait for the game to say all right rounds over yeah i have to fight the angel <laughs> Oh, they're gonna kill the fucking relic while I'm over here. So, this won't surprise you, but the angle ended up exploding the drive and failing the mission. Between all the enemies gaining over guard, having to deal with a pseudo DPS check, and doing absolutely fuck and all to the angle itself, yeah, this was functionally impossible. So this was, yet again, another scenario in which I had to pull in assistance to help me. But... After that, we extracted, and all Star Chart nodes are officially completed. It's over. <laughs> I took one final look at my stats, checked my node count, danced a little jig, and I did not complete the star chart with only a stug. You know, it's been a literal year since I started this. Oh, wait, oh my god, it's been two? And if you stuck through this the entire time, uh, first off, why? But second, uh, thank you? I think? I, I don't think it's a good idea to give encouragement to a bunch of internet sadists watching a video man drain his life as his way on something as stupid as this, but at this point, I'm just glad it's done. But massive apologies for taking 40 years to finish this. Really? Really shouldn't have taken this long. But now that it is, we can all move on to bigger and better things. In my case, I'm going to taste test various types of chlorine now, since I feel that would have been a better use of my time. As for the rest of you, never ask me for anything ever again! Trib out!